Well, today we're starting a series called Play to Win. You know, in life, we have lots of different parallels or illustrations that bring us uh, in simplicity or in a nutshell, uh, little aspects of our lives that we can learn from. And sports is a great learning opportunity, isn't it? Because sport is always about, uh, about doing your best, being your best. It's about competition. It's about uh, sometimes you get hurt. Sometimes you end up uh, losing. Obviously, sometimes you win. And so sport is a really good illustration for life. Uh, we talk about teams, we talk about individuals, and yet all of this talking about sport leaves us in a place where we know that to win, we have to get better. And that's what our spiritual life is all about. To win, we need to be in that place of perpetually, perpetually allowing ourselves to be under that hand of God and to be shaped to be better. Now, we're running a little bit short on time today, so what I'm going to attempt to do is take the beginning of my talk and the end of my talk and smash it together. So if there's any point you don't understand what I'm saying, I probably don't know either. So um, we're, going to, we're going to push on. Okay, the thing about playing to win is that we live in a world of... Uh, turn this on. We live in a world of complexity. Who would agree with that comment? We live in a world of complexity. Life is so different to the way it used to be. And I think for myself, just in the last few weeks, uh, I've seen how that's happened with my own daughter. She's um, just started a small business online uh, making soy candles, and that's supposed to be the latest, greatest thing. And uh, her and a friend have got this business that made these candles. Our home has smelt like a a bouquet of floristry in the last six months as she's gone and tested all these different aromas. And uh, I said, well, how are you going to get on with the marketing of this? And she said, well, we do it all online. And I said, oh, okay, that's cool. Well, just two days ago, I was out in the garage where she's doing all her stuff, and she had these beautiful wooden boxes with some candles in there and some fruit juices and some nice things to eat. And I said, what, what's all this about? If, if somebody ordered all these? And she goes, no, no, these are to gift to my online influencers. I said, oh, speak English? And, uh, and she says, no, what I do, Dad, is <clears throat> I gift these boxes to people who have folks following them online through Instagram. I said, right, okay. What does that mean? <laughs> and she says, well, what they will do is they'll open the box, they'll look at the candles, and then they will talk about what they've discovered and how nice they smell and all that sort of thing, and they'll upload that to their Instagram account where other people can learn with them about how good these candles are. I said, oh, okay, now I know. And so sure enough, this is exactly what happened. We found that uh, this person and uploaded this, all this commentary about her candles and how nice they are. And so this is marketing in today's world. It's a viral marketing system. So I've never heard of this before, uh, but apparently it works that if somebody's got X amount of people following them on Twitter or Instagram, uh, they will take your product as a free product and they'll just talk about it. But if they've got lots and lots of people following them, like you know, 10,000 or 20,000 people, you will pay the influencer to talk about your product, okay? And uh, that's why apparently the Kardashians are so wealthy, is because they talk about products and somebody's just paid them a million dollars to talk about their product because they've got millions of followers. So it's all about influence. Now for me, that was a whole new world and there's a complexity about that, but there's probably a simplicity about it as well, but there's a complexity about that which is different to what I am used to. And our lives are filled with this level of complexity, aren't they? Um, it's just the nature of the way in which the world works. And the biggest challenge for us in a world that is increasingly complex is that if we don't engage with that world, we'll end up reducing our world and keeping with our capacity. And so therefore we become smaller and smaller and smaller and our world becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. So as Christians, I think we need to be engaged with whatever God's doing in the world and that means that we need to face up to this complexity. Now, within our Christian lives, there's a level of complexity as well. Um, we know that we consist of our physical body, we have emotional well-being, our spiritual well-being, we have relationships, 
And all of these can either grow or be reduced, depending on the pressure that you feel, or more, more subtly, depending on how God is working in your life. You see, God wants to make you a person who's more like Christ. And Jesus was very much a man of, uh, of the world in as much as he was walking in and through society without any problems. And so this complexity that we face is always about growing us up, allowing us to face challenges and grow through it. Now, using sports as an illustration, um, here's a picture, a silhouette of a shot putter. Now, wouldn't life be simple if your sole role in life was to get out of bed in the morning and throw a shot put? There's nothing complex about throwing a shot put. In fact, I looked it up the other day. The perfect angle to throw the shot is 45 degrees. Okay, so if you can get your arm to release that weight at 45 degree angle, it gives the perfect balance between height and trajectory and maximizes the effort to get the furthest distance. All right? So that is a really, really simple thing to do, to um, uh, simply put a shot. All right? Think of Usain Bolt, fastest man in the world. All he had to do was look at the far end of the lane and go as fast as he could. All right? Pretty simple stuff, really. And if he got there in front of everybody else, he won. It's pretty simple. Okay, I've never had that experience, but apparently it's pretty simple. Now, what's happened is he's had a midlife crisis, and he's gone off to play professional football. And the people are saying he's a great attraction, but he can't play football for nuts. Okay, because what he's got to do is he's now moved into this world of complexity. It's all very well to run from one end of the paddock down to the other, but this time he's got to take the ball with him. Okay, And he's got to make sure his mates are with him as well. And he's got to get up against the opposition and uh, navigate his way around them and score the goal. And those who know these things about football have said, really, this is just last week, he said, really, in 100 years, Usain Bolt is not going to make a soccer player. All right? Complexity. Complexity. So life's not always that easy. You know, it's not like if you were just simply a caterpillar. What are you going to do today? I'm going to eat. What are you going to do tomorrow? I'm just going to eat. Okay, that's life, just eating, pretty simple. But we're called to a life of emotional, intellectual, and spiritual complexity. Now, one of the things that I like about uh, the Olympics is just this variety of sports that occurs in front of us, and probably nothing more spectacular than the gymnastics, yeah? You know, it's all very well to do a backwards flip, It's all very well to do a twist. It's all very well to hold on to a bar and swing. But when you put all of these things together instantaneously, one after another, the complexity in that is amazing, isn't it? And don't we all become experts when the Olympics are on? You know? (laughs) Somebody's doing a floor exercise, you know, they bounce, bounce, twist, jump, this, and then they land in the final corner and they have their foot out by half an inch and we go, ah, loser. It's terrible, isn't it? It's human nature. We all think we're experts, you know? And yet 99.9% of us couldn't do a a backwards flip to save our lives. Probably break our necks. Okay, straight to the scripture. But you can see the complexity. Okay? And compare that complexity to what Jesus actually called his disciples to. Uh, Please ignore that uh, reference there. We got that wrong today. Um, It's actually in Matthew's Gospel, I think, chapter 7. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. And once they left their nets and followed him, going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with their father Zebedee, preparing their nets. Jesus called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. Come follow me. Come follow me sounds like a very, very simple directive, doesn't it? Okay. It's not complicated. It sounds about as simple as just casting a net. You know, because being a fisherman in those days wasn't too complicated. Cast the net, fell down, picked up the fish, you brought them on board and sold them. Come follow me seems like a very, very simple thing to do. But the thing about being a follower of Christ is it's not what we do, it's how we do it. And this is where the complexity comes in. Because for us to be able to serve the Lord in a way that actually brings honor and glory to him, 
We have to allow God to be continuously working in our lives. And that means there'll be time when you're doing the, the flips and you're full flat on your face. You know, you're doing those floor exercises in, in a spiritual fashion and you're, you're messing up, falling outside of the boundaries. But for each one of us, the journey that we're on is something that we have to continue to allow God to do in our lives, bring these challenges into our lives, or we end up reducing, reducing our lives to a very, very small arena. The challenge for us is to be engaged with society and realize that falling on our face is part of the journey. Yeah? Falling on your face is part of the journey. And each one of us needs to have the capacity before God to realize that failure is just the next step to success. All of these folks that we just saw making a mess of themselves in a competitive environment like this, uh, that would not, I guarantee you, be the end of their journey as gymnasts they would have learnt that this is part of the learning process and getting up and getting on is all about this spiritual dynamic of winning. Jesus said, sorry, Paul said, and again, got the wrong reference here, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now, when we consider... um, when we consider all of these different fruit of the Spirit, like love and peace, they all sound quite good, don't they? They sound like wonderful things to aim at. Um, self-control, in your Bible, it might actually be um, forbearance or long-suffering. Sometimes it's translated as that, self-control. But, you know, the other day, uh, on, uh, hold on, Friday, I was coming down from Auckland... Uh, in the middle of the Labour weekend traffic. And, um, you know, it's all very well to have self-control when you're sitting there doing nothing, but did you lose your peace in the middle of it, okay? Or even even worse, did you um, lose your love for your fellow driver on the road? You know... I was coming back from um, Taupo through to Tauranga about two weeks ago in the evening. And um, I was driving behind a queue of people and uh, there was this one particular person who was right in front of us who was travelling at 70 k's the whole way. And we get to the passing lane and you thought, right, this person's going to pull over to the left. Yeah? Yeah. Well, they didn't, eh? They stayed in the right-hand lane. And this passing lane is two kilometres long. It's a really long passing lane. Some of you might be familiar with it. It's one of the longest passing lanes in the North Island. And so the person who was immediately behind the car pulls over to the left to pass them on the inside. Yeah. And then they stopped because they must have been wondering, is it legal to pass on this side? I don't know if it is or not. It's not? No. No. So they stopped, and they too were doing 70 kilometres an hour. (laughs) So for two kilometres, there would have been at least 25 cars were going down down this passing lane at 70 kilometres an hour. And, um, you know, my patience was running out, and my amount of love for my fellow driver was slowly dying, and any attempt at self-control... And, uh, and I was losing that joy. All of these things, these fruit of the Spirit that was supposed to be well and truly in my life had now disappeared. And um, Michaela and I have this little conversation at times. We say, over the age of 15, if you've got at least 20 years driving experience, you should be able to have a surface-to-air missile tied to the roof of your car. <laughs> but you're only allowed one a year. Okay, I figured that was sort of quite self-control. Well, this is one of those times when I wished I had a surface-to-air missile because this person deserved it. They might have been somebody's father or grandmother, cousin, uncle, brother, sister, or child, but I was going to arrange them to meet Jesus. (laughs) Now, that doesn't say anything about them. That says a whole lot about me, though, doesn't it? Yeah, you're really concerned now. Okay, you're really concerned, and justifiably so. You see... The fruit of the Spirit in our lives 
is actually a level of complexity that God wants us to engage with. Because it's all very well um, to have to have joy in our lives, but as soon as somebody winds you up, you find that your patience disappears and your joy disappears. These things are designed by God to allow us to grow to maturity. And um, it doesn't take much in life to signal to us that we've got some challenges that we have to work through. And these things can happen really, really quickly, can't they? I mean, driving's a great example because it's sort of a, a neutral thing we can talk about and it's always somebody else's fault, right? You know, it's easy, isn't it, with driving? It's always somebody else's fault. Uh, but just last Tuesday, I um, drove down to uh, the crossing at Taurico to, to meet with somebody <clears throat> and my car's got one of those uh, things that come up and tells you how many kilometres are left in the tank. You know, cruise distance, it's called. And I jumped in the car and I looked down and it said 28 kilometres to go. And, um, and I thought, oh, okay, I'll get to the crossing and back. And I'm driving down Moffat Road. It says 27, 26, zero. <laughs> I said, hey, somebody's stolen my petrol as I'm driving down the road. What's going on here? You know? So all of a sudden, instantly, my whole demeanour changed, you know? I was going down a slight hill, so I was kicking the, out into neutral and coasting down the hill, you know? And then I get down to the crossing, and there was two people parked in front of me trying to work out which way to go, and I'm like, surface-to-air missile, get out of the way, yeah? And anyway, you'll be so grateful to know that uh, E for Enough got me to the petrol station. But I just, like, instantly, my whole demeanour changed because I was going to run out of fuel. And this is how we learn about ourselves. You know, we've got to ask ourselves, what, what is it that sets you off? What is it that winds you up? Because these are the things in the complexity of our lives that are the challenges that God wants us to work through. What happens when you go to do some work or just play on your computer and the internet's down? Short breath, okay? It's all right, I'm looking over here, you guys, eh? You young folks. And yeah, internet's down. There's never been a world without the internet, eh? <laughs> never, ever, ever. Look, I tell you how old I am when I was just a little bit older than, younger than Jacina, who just got baptized. Um, my phone, our phone was, our phone ring was two shorts and one long. <laughs> yeah? And we used to have a party line, okay? It wasn't mean a party, but you had people on the phone at the same time. Yeah, so that's how old I am. So internet, you know, is such a new phenomenon, and yet it's a, third, it's a first world problem, isn't it, when it breaks down. But you'd think the world had come to an end when it does. Again, we're learning. We're learning. But one of the things that we have to learn about our, our own demeanour, about our own, uh, our own personalities, is that it's very easy to take things back from God when we're in the middle of a stressful situation. You see, the easiest thing to do is to say, God, I'm in control. And we don't even think of it in those terms. Usually when something's going bad, we just say, I've got to make a decision, got to make a decision, do, 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 make a decision. And what we end up doing is we then kick back into the way in which the world thinks, the way in which the flesh operates, and we don't give God a chance to actually come through with the answers. And that's why you know, the fruit of the Spirit is so important, not just because they're a goal for our level of, of the way we portray ourselves, but they're actually the mechanism by which God comes into your life. Okay, So if you're going through a tough time, even James says, consider it pure joy, my friends, when all of you face trials of many kinds. And when I first read this, I thought James had problems. I really, I thought, man, you... You, you know, you probably just walk on cut glass just for the fun of it. You know, so, but we realize that what James is saying here is that this is a tough time, but I can guarantee you there will be joy in here if you look for what God is doing in the midst of it. That is a level of maturity that we're called to in a world of complexity because there are so many things that happen to us that will rob us of our joy, and yet God said he is always going to be with us. So where is he with us 
at these, in this time. And, and the, probably the hardest thing we ever learn is this one here, isn't it? Patience. We all want patience right now. Um, and I know that the, the, as I've got older that I've realised that time is actually your friend. If you give God time, he'll bring a good answer to you. But if we're impatient, we get what we deserve, and that's usually the thing that's right around the next corner. So what we're talking about here is, is Christian composure. Now, composure, uh, by the dictionary definition, is the ability to know peace during a time of challenge or to know uh, calm in a time of stress. If somebody keeps their composure, it means that they aren't being rattled by the situation. And that sounds like a good place to be when everybody else is freaking out around you. Um, now let me, I'm just going to share with you um, a couple of stories that for me personally have always, for me personally have sort of showed me where I'm at. One's, one's a sort of a I'm proud of myself moment and the other one's a I'm not so happy with me moment. Um, last year I was going up to Indonesia to a conference, I was speaking up there and um, I had one of these flights out of the Auckland airport at midnight. So it's always a tough time, you get up there and you book in. So I'm there around about quarter to ten for a midnight flight. I go to check in and the uh, computer at the, the check in there says uh, go and see a, uh, a manager or something. So I'm like, hmm, that's a bit weird. And so I wander over and I talk to somebody at the desk and they look at my ticket and they say, oh, I'm sorry to tell you but you're not booked in. I said, well, I've got my ticket here that says I have and I've paid the money. Um, they said, well, just leave it with me and we'll sort it out. So I'm standing there and 10 minutes, 20 minutes later and a few more people come in, they whisper. I know what they're saying is, I'll meet you later for a drink, eh? Let's just pretend we're working. Okay? Because they're all whispering behind, you know, and then they're on their computers and they're telling each other's emails saying, yeah, I'll feed your cat when you're on holiday because I don't know what they do. They take, seem to take forever. But anyway, they said to us, sorry, Mr. Vernal, you do not have a flight book with us. There seems to have been some error. And I said, well, how does this make sense? And they said, no, it doesn't make sense to us either. And then they said, what we'll do is we'll phone your travel agent, who happens to be a friend of mine, so in Auckland, and they phone her, and she's like, oh, freaked out. So I'm there for an hour and a half. And then finally, they said, yep, we've got your ticket. And the plane was going in less than an hour. And uh, I said, oh, that's cool. They said, we don't know how we're going to get you back, but we'll work it out later. I said, that's fine, that's fine. And then they said, right, but now we've got a problem. The flight is closed. They're not allowing any more people to go on the plane. I said, so I've got a ticket, but I'm not allowed to get on the plane. Yes, that's right. So it's no point having the ticket then, is it? Not really, no. Um, <laughs> am I going to get to my destination? Well, the plane's going, yeah, but will I be on it? Long story short, after going up the chain of command, they finally talked to the pilot of the plane to see whether they could let me on. And finally, I got on the plane and I got to my destination. Now, the interesting thing about that was my travel agent got hold of me a few days later and said, Craig, I cannot believe how composed you were during that time. Well, for me, it was one of those things that was out of my hands, out of my control. What's the point of yelling and screaming at anybody? It's not going to change anything, is it? And so uh, I've always got this idea that if you can't change it, you're not in control of it, any emotion that you project upon the situation is not going to help at all, right? However, <laughs> um, about a month ago, Michaela and I were coming up the South Island. I was visiting a number of churches and having uh, some meetings and retreats and different things. And uh, one evening I was on Trade Me, as men do, and um, I, I was looking for some safety trousers for chainsawing. You know, I was chainsawing my wood, and my, my kids said to me, Dad, come on, you need some more safety gear. And uh, why? Oh, you'll cut your leg. And I'm like, ah, oh, that's all right. I, my, my legs are big enough. I only need one. And, uh, and they said, no, buy some safety trousers. Okay. So these things are really expensive, eh? They're called chaps. Really expensive. Anywhere from $160, $180. And so, anyway, I'm on trade me, and I see this pair of safety trousers. But it's a whole lot of gear, okay? Safety trousers, 
a chainsaw that's done an hour and a half's work, uh, four pairs of earmuffs, which is cool because I can invite the neighbours to come around and watch, uh, oil, spare chain, all these things, $200. I said, Michaela, look, this is a gift from God. <laughs> 200 bucks, plus the safety chaps, which are worth 160 on their own. And so I said, got to buy it. So I bought it now, hallelujah. And uh, anyway, when I was in Christchurch, went around and picked up all this gear. And uh, Michaela says, how are you going to get it home? And I said, well, you got a big suitcase? And she says, you're not sticking that in my suitcase. It's got grease and oil and all that. And I said, oh, yeah, okay. I said, what I'll do is I'll take it on as hand luggage. I'll just break it down. I'll take the chainsaw blade off, and I've got a bag. I can put it on there. So easy. It gets to Nelson Airport, and um, I'm checking in hand luggage. Bullets, no. Knives, blades, no. Internal combustion engines, when did they change the rules? I've never known them. You're not allowed to take internal combustion engines on the plane. Well, I'd never ever looked before, you see. So here we are, 40 minutes before the flight's due to go, and I went up to the lady, I said, it's only a little little internal combustion engine. <laughs> and she says, no, sir, you're not allowed that on the plane. I'm like, well, what do I do with this thing? And then I thought, I know, I'll courier at home. There must be a courier around the airport somewhere. So we Googled the courier, found that there's one three Ks down the road, and, uh, and I thought... I've got the rental car, I've still got the keys. So I go out to the uh, rental car depot where you drop the rental car off. But you know about rental car systems is that they only allow you to come in and they don't allow you to go out once you've got <laughs> your rental car. So I had this chainsaw and I <laughs> put it in the car and I was driving round and round the car park trying to find a way out. And then I saw that the way in was not congested at all. <laughs> And it was only about a 30-metre little run, one-way run. I thought, I'm only going to go one way. And, and so I was waiting there, waiting there, no traffic. <laughs> Down, dropped the uh, chainsaw off at DHL, and uh, I was back in time for coffee before my flight. And I was absolutely proud of myself, and I feel absolutely guilty for breaking the law. But you see, it's all about patience. Joy, self-control. I'm just looking for one that I actually have achieved in that event. But <laughs> kindness, goodness, faithfulness. My wife was very gentle. <laughs> and uh, it's all about how we respond, isn't it? And you find that life throws you all these different things to respond at. And how you respond to them in this world of complexity is going to define your life and your witness to others around you. Um, Michaela's been unwell today. She's not here, so I can tell this story. Um, she put a load of washing on last night, and I went to hang it out. And she got this beautiful, brand-new, mustard-coloured dress. It's just worn it once. And uh, anyway, I got put through the wash with my black-and-white check shirt. So I've now got a uh, black and yellow check shirt. <laughs> it, it came up really well, actually. It's sort of, the colour through it is perfect. There's no sort of patterns in it. It looks really good, so I'll probably wear it in a week or two. Um, but those times you look at that and you just got to go, let's just laugh. What can you do about it? There's nothing that can be done about it. And God is good in the midst of all of those challenging and trying times. Do you agree? Great. Let's stand and pray. Lord, it's good to be celebrating a labour weekend. And yet the very definition of our faith is that we do not labour to earn our salvation, but we offer our bodies as living sacrifices so that you can do your work in us according to your will and your good pleasure that will bring us to maturity in the day of Christ. And we thank you, Lord, that in this world of complexity, we can push in and embrace the world around us and take the challenges that are given to us as a sign of your love, that you want to continue to grow us up. Our Lord, we, we don't want to reduce our world to that which we can own or handle, but we want to grow our lives so that we can be 
of greater and greater value to you. Lord, we thank you when we're challenged by the fruit of the Spirit that don't seem to be in our lives. We thank you that these are things for us to have as work-ons, and uh, there's always seemed to be plenty of those. But Lord, to keep us agile, to keep us fresh, to keep us engaged, we just invite the work of your Spirit into our lives to ensure that we are uh, ready and open and willing, participating in the world that you've given us, and that we might take this complexity, embrace it, and uh, be able to share your love with others. And so we ask all of this in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. 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 God bless you. God bless you.